Hi, welcome to another episode of The Hot Ball with me, Eamon Fennell. Thanks to AIG for sponsoring and Dublin GEA for giving us this platform to be able to talk to players. On this episode, we're going to be talking to Dublin footballer and hurler Shane Ryan about his time in the Dublin jersey, how he moved from hurling to football back to hurling, very similar to Michael Jordan from basketball to baseball back to basketball. So... On this episode, we'll be talking to Dublin's very own MJ and going through some of his highlights. Hope you enjoy it. Well, Shane, welcome to the Hot Ball with me, Eamon Fennell, and AIG and Dublin GEA. On today's episode, I want to take a bit of a look back uh, down memory lane of your time with Dublin. Uh, your career as a cornerback, halfback, midfielder, hurler, your history in the family of being just from good GAA stock and, you know, towards the end of your career, moving that transition between football and hurling. So I suppose I want to kick off with 2001 because everyone has fond memories of 2001. And for me, that memory is going down on a bus from O'Toole's, uh, stopping off, having a few cans on the way, getting into tourists, loads of crack, going to watch the game and just having the best time ever. And I think for a lot, this was obviously the first game, it wasn't the replay. And I think uh, for a lot of fans, that was the case as well. Like you still have fond memories of that day. For you, Shane Ryan, the corner back, what was that like? Uh, to be, I'd be very, very similar, to be honest. I'd have... <laughs> you had the cans before. <laughs> you had, uh, I only, only had the two or three, like, but... Uh, <laughs> No, but fond memories, you know, would have a lot of fond memories. And I suppose when you think about it, getting, coming so close to beating them, uh, you know, and, and I still have fond memories about it. But I mean, I was playing, like I was, I was named cornerback. I was kind of playing fullback. Uh, I was, I know I was marking Darrow Canada and obviously a huge name. I'd grown up watching him playing for a number of years before that. But the whole thing was, I suppose, still kind of new for me. I was only a couple of years in the panel. You were in from the right. night. You brought, brought in in 1999, was it? Uh, 98, I would have started, yeah. All right. I kind of came in after the league in 98, before the championship. And uh, so it was It was just, yeah, the whole experience was same for me. Well, for me, it was new anyway. Still kind of new. But for the fans going down the country that hadn't happened, doesn't happen too often, we stopped off and we stayed in the horse and jockey uh, the night before, I think. And like it's, I suppose it wouldn't happen now. It wouldn't happen for a lot. Like we used to go and get ice creams before the game and stuff. <laughs> uh, you have to keep your pre-match routines, you know. Magnum yeah. points is delicious. <laughs> but uh, I, I think I think one way the main memories is getting the bus and driving the tourists and seeing a sea of blue when you're driving the tourists square. It was unreal. And like that, that moment, that's obviously etched in your memory forever. When you're actually going down there and when you look back at the team, there's some amazing... Like, Colly, Colly Moran was full forward in that game, I think. He was named the full forward anyway. Uh, there's some amazing players in that game, uh, on that Dublin team, but also that Kerry team as well. Like, it was a unbelievable... Like, when you put the 15 on 15 down on paper and the careers them players had, it's incredible. Yeah, like Kerry had... I suppose if you totted up all the All Ireland medals that that team would have had, it'd be an awful lot, you know. And I mean, I'd still count the likes of Seamus Moynihan, one of the best players I ever played against. He was just pure class, like watching, you know, probably should have been watching my man a bit more now. <laughs> <laughs> Is that <laughs> but, why you uh, kind of got into the, to the more defensive role? Like you started off centre back, oh, sorry, uh, full back, corner back, into the half backs for a bit, and then into midfield. Like, was someone like Seamus Moynihan who you modelled your game on? When you're playing well, in a defensive position, yeah. Well, I would have, I would have admired him for a number of years, you know. And to be honest with you, the positions I played wasn't really down to, you know, I, I, I modelled myself on Seamus Moynihan, so I want you to play him in a few different positions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just got put somewhere there. You're playing there, all right. <laughs> kill, 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 kill. Like I'd never played cornerback in my life till Tommy Carr put me there, but. You know yourself, you're not going to say anything. Yeah, great, I'll do, I'll play whatever you want. Like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I played fullback in those carry matches, that was probably more to do with, you're not marking John Crowley because he was on fire and they wanted Paddy Christie marking him. 
So who's left? Shane will take him, you know. But uh, and then oh, who's left? Oh, it's only Daryl Pineda, like. Yeah, and like even when you. But, look uh, back, sorry, go on. No, I was finished. But, but like when you look back on them games, defenders back then were so isolated. You know, like the the fifteen man defense or getting people behind the ball wasn't really as prominent back then as it is now. So as a defender back then playing them like all star, all Ireland winning like forwards, must have been really tough. It was, yeah. But I, like I would have been you know, when I was playing there, I was the youngest on the line and playing beside the likes of Paddy Christie or Paddy Moore, who, you know, all Ireland medals as well and massive experience. So I kind of follow their lead a bit and get a bit of guidance from them and, and uh, here's what to do. You know, Paddy Moore might give me guidance, like give him a dig. <laughs> but uh, no, it wasn't like that. He never said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, you're right. Like the game was totally different back then. It's nearly 20 years ago, I suppose. And the game was totally different. So, uh, but that was just, that was all you knew, you know. You, there was, you wouldn't have even thought, God, I wish the halfbacks would come back a bit and give us some cover because it wasn't part of the game. They have to, they're doing their attacking. Paul Kern, you know, one of the best attacking halfbacks we had. You, you know, he, he needs to make his, his runs and do, do what he does best as well. So you're not going to complain. And I certainly wasn't going to complain to any, anyone like that, you know. Yeah, and like, the, the, that game obviously goes down in... Like GA history, especially with Dublin and Kerry GAs, and it's just like an unbelievable uh, two games because of Morris Fitzgerald's score at the end. But uh, Dublin have had some great away days as well. Like you know, it's not always in Crowbar. I know we get a lot of flack about that, but like you were there in 2006 when we went down to Longford, and uh, it was a Clonus in '03 as well. That mm. you know, like it's just some great days, and it's. Like, I don't think as a player. We mind going out at Crow Park, or did you like ever? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, I always loved it. But like, like, sure, like we go, you go all over the country playing the national league anyway, you know. And then you get to the big, like you know, I remember the two get the two other games I mentioned there: Clonus in 03 against Derry, and then Longford in 06. Like the the the, the buzz we could feel. We knew there was, there was a buzz among supporters, and we could feel it because you're. You know, the bus is driving down the road and cars know it's the Dublin team because they see in the window and everyone's beeping the horn. There's loads of cars on the motorway. And you see people stopped at all the shops, gangs of dubs everywhere. So you could sense there was a really good atmosphere going to be there. And there were, there were lovely days, particularly the Longford day was one of the hottest days I remember ever playing a match. Thank God the you there back then. Uh, <laughs> that was almost, it was almost on its way out there, I think. <laughs> But they, they were they were great days, and I like particularly the Longford one because the, the the pitch or the crowd would be nearly on top of you there, and the, and the atmosphere was mad. And they played well; they nearly turned us over that day as well. But you you always kind of like you were always a real team man, like, and what I mean by that is like you love being around the team. Like you, I think my memories of you were just about always being around people and having the crack. And them away days give you that. Like, it gives you a chance to really get into, like, a good bonding uh, like environment with players. So, like, them trips down, like, you know, it kind of b- builds the morale within the team, training camps and all that kind of stuff. Moving into more of the training camp area, we probably didn't do as much as the current teams. Like, do you think that's a big part of getting that unity within the team now that like, you need to go on these trips, you need to have these team bondings to take a break from the Dublin bubble and get outside of Dublin for a bit. Yeah, I suppose that, yeah, that would, it would be a good thing. I mean, I, I suppose when I was playing, uh, you still, even if we did, it, we did it less back then, it would still be, you'd still spend more time with the team than anyone else in your life, you know, yeah, yeah. unless you're, unless you're married maybe, but I wasn't at the time. So, You'd see the lads more often than anyone else, with the exception of maybe people you work with, but you're nearly seeing them every day. And you do, you build up just, you get to know each other well, the crack you have, you, you know, whatever you need to do. Sometimes you're out away on, on weekends or whatever, and you have a bit of downtime and you could be playing cards or just having a mess, watching TV together. And it, all that adds up, you know. It, it, it. But you're probably in an area where, like, <laughs> Social media and camera phones weren't big back then, so it was great. Thank God. <laughs> Especially for them Sunnybank days after the championship games. Oh. <laughs> but like 
from if you put yourself in a Dublin player's shoes right now and just to get a bit of perspective, like after a game you're being analyzed, like you go straight onto your phone, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's it's Instagram, you're looking at reports, you're seeing comments instantly, like would you like would you as a player who loved just being around the team and being around uh, that environment? Would you moving into this kind of area now? Would you hate to be in that area of just like social media and people being able to kind of judge your games right there and reading these comments and not being able to get away from the madness that is social media? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd say. I'd say probably the seven old irons I have in my pocket might uh, make it <laughs> feel a bit better. <laughs> That's just your profile picture, is it? <laughs> uh, I, no, I see. Yeah, I, I suppose because I, well, you know, I, I was You get that? Is it, were you happy to be in that time where the, this wasn't as big as it is now? Like, well, I didn't know any difference, to be honest. You know, like I, I suppose in a way, I might, you might think, God, you know, if I. Like I, I, I'd say, if you talk, look at training, for example, and I, I, th- I kind of pinpoint maybe around 2005 when, I, when we were training we really kicked up a notch and it really started to turn professional and bringing science into it and more about looking after players and it wasn't just about running laps and pitches. And, you know, by that stage I was 27. But if I just, I, if I just started that when I was 19 or 20, you know, maybe I wouldn't have been like probably loads of people carrying all these niggles that you carry through your whole life. And, you know, some days when you can't even lift up your kids because your back is killing you. Like. But, you know, maybe your career went to last an extra couple of years if you had looked after yourself better. Um, but, I mean, the, I think the mindset of the players they, these days is more about where can I get an edge, where can I get better? What analysis can you give me that makes me better? And I'm going to work on that, you know? So that's, all, that's what they know and that's what they're used to, all the lads that are playing nowadays. We just didn't have, when I started, it was none of that. Yeah, because like even, like when I came onto the panel in 2005, I remember we, we might do some video work uh, the week before a championship game. And that was really it then. Like, you know, there might be a talk, like we'd have talks in the dressing room and, and in the hall and David's, but there was no real like full on analysis. So. When, when you're when you were playing back then, like in between, even in that p- pillar era of two thousand and five to two thousand and eight, what stands out for you? Like, what was the most enjoyable moments for you? Uh, on the pitch, off the pitch, I, 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 like I, I, like for me, I want to have some notes. Like you know, oh five, just winning the. Uh, the the Leinster Cup for the first time in a while like that was a highlight of Collie and Casey like they loved that moment more than anything it was just uh, yeah definitely was well I there's you know there's loads where would I start I mean I could start with that uh, like we'd had one in 2002 I remember saying to myself in 2001 uh, when we lost our third final in a row and I, I was just thinking if I could win one Leinster title I'd retire happy it'd be great then we won in 2002 and suddenly, that's not enough, we're going to win again. Then we had two bad years. Well, we had two, one okay year and one bad year then. And then you went to win it again, you're like, this, it was, it was, it was fantastic. And uh, you're like, what you said about the team, like the crack with the team was just phenomenal. You know, like we, you know, the way I remember it anyway, like, well, I certainly did. We trained hard, uh, worked hard, did everything I was supposed to do, you know, on the pitch. And then after you win a big game like that, some celebrations were brilliant. <laughs> I, I had this conversation with Collie, and I, and I remember my my memory. Two thousand and five was my first year, and when we won the Leinster, uh, we went out Sunday night, Monday night, I think Tuesday night. You were there. Uh, Wednesday night. When was, you say you was there, I was at training. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, some <laughs> and then Wednesday we were out. I was half going training on Thursday. This was just me, like, you know, a young lad coming through. I half expected we would be going for a few points after training on Thursday as well. But, like, there was great fun, like, you know, and I, and I think we, we obviously took it to the limits. But them nights out after them games were just, they were, they were great fun because the team was so, like, it was such a good team uh, to be around players. There wasn't as much drama back then. Uh, 
And like when you have a big win like 2005 and what that meant for the county, and when you look back at the game, the highlights of the aftermath of that were just unbelievable. You kind of miss it in Leinster, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, it's, I suppose it's so different now then, you know. I, was, I mean, that's just like Dublin are just so far ahead of everyone there. And um, it, well, like, I suppose it, it's made, it's made, it was made better back then because you had rivals and you, you got huge crowds, packed crowds, and you had, you know, there was no, like, you know, everyone, everyone nowadays thinks Dublin are going to walk Leinster, but it was never, there was no guarantees back then. And there was there was always someone there, whether it was Kildare or Leash, uh, waiting or Westmead as well. Another year, waiting in the wings to, you know, well, like, get one over on you. Yeah, and that kind of leads into 2006. Like 2006, uh, coming off the back of a great year in 2005, winning Leinster. You personally had an unbelievable year in 2006. You went, were you nominated for the All Star? You were on the Compromise Rules team. I think you won a Sigurds in with. DCU? No, not seriously. What did you win with DCU? Uh, I won the Ryan Cup in <laughs> 1999. <laughs> uh, I might have <laughs> that, was put that team by mistake then. Uh, but you had a great year in 2006 yourself then. Uh, yeah, that was like, again, that was like, when I, when I said how the, the, the training was, was kicked up a notch more professional in 2005 and I just, you know, every year from then on, it got better and better. And they were always the managing team, you know, Pillar and Clarkey. Uh, they were always looking for the extra angle. How can we make this better? And I just, I loved going training. Absolutely loved going training. And I'd, I'd be there early. You do your few weights before the session. And my, like, I know it wasn't always like this, but I, my memories are driving into St. David's and it's sunny. And, you know, everyone's happy and we're winning matches and train was brilliant. You know, and you're young and you're fit and you're feeling good and you're excited and you think you're going to win the All Ireland and everyone was, you know, happy memories. Like I know it didn't happen any of the, any year that I was playing, but that, yeah. that's how I remember it. Well, like that's my kind of memories as well. But when you said like you enjoyed training, I, I have a fond memory of you, uh, like from that documentary that was shot in 2005, where you were doing running session and absolutely gassed on the ground, uh, lads <laughs> trying to drag you up. So, you know, you didn't enjoy it as much as you say you did, but it, it was actually... The mind blocked these things out. <laughs> but it was funny because, uh, but like in training, I remember doing a lot of fart leg sessions. Like we, we did a lot of uh, endurance runs, long distance runs, uh, really heavy loads back then. And yes, they were challenging, but you never really enjoyed them. And like I talked to Casey and Casey was kind of saying that he enjoyed them. He was fit. He was, he, he actually had a running background. He did cross country when he was younger. But then when it comes to the match, you just had this bundle of energy. You seemed to cover every blade of grass. Like what was the difference between you and being at training and hating running? And then when you get to matches, Whatever that is in your head just switches off and you can just cover every blade of glass, grass. Or... Uh, well, first of all, I used to, I would usually end up in training sessions, particularly with those fartlex, I always end up somehow in Paul Casey's group. <laughs> so that was a bad start already. Like, CISO was just gone. And then you're just getting given out because you're not keeping up with your teammates. Uh, so, like, he was just, he was just a run all day kind of job. Like I, I suppose I never really liked the runs where you don't know where the end is. I love if you say, right, 100 meter runs, you're doing 10 of them. Great. I know where the finish line is and I know how many I'm doing. But it's, you know, far collect session, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off until I tell you to stop. You know, you know yeah, yeah. didn't like it. But then on the pitch, the difference then on the pitch is just like, I suppose there, you, you play sport because you're competitive. You love it, but you're competitive. And, it's more of a competition. There's a ball there to be won. And it's like, it's nearly like, well, if I do this big run, I'm going to get a reward. I'm going to get the ball. If I'm on the training pitch, there's no reward. There's no ball there. So if you're running for a ball and you get to, I'm racing you and I'm going to beat you to the ball, you know, and then I get my reward. I get to get the ball. <laughs> it sounds like a kid, you know, I get the ball. <laughs> <laughs> you get the ball you go home if you don't get to the ball. Like, yeah, my ball. Yeah, yeah, I'm going. But, but it was, it's just the competitiveness of, you know, uh, like I'm in a competition here. It's me against him. I want it, and I'm going to get it. 
and, and speaking of that competition because like in around that time there was myself yourself Kieran Whelan Darren Holman Darren McGee Declan Mantney John Coughlin uh, there could have been another midfielder I just, I just remember there was like Dennis Bastig there was yeah. just, I think I know yeah and, Kieran Whelan Darren Holman Declan Mantney Eamon Fennell Shane Ryan yeah. <laughs> you, Peter Stringer you got the jersey uh, <laughs> And, and that's what kind of, uh, like, I think for whatever reason, uh, Pillar or Talty or, or Davy Billings just wanted to have so much competition around the middle. And from your point of view, how did you find competing with so many different kind of, uh, like your game was totally different to Wheelos and yet you complemented each other so well. Uh, but like myself and the other lads that I named, we didn't have the, the attributes that you had, like, you know. So, like, I found it really challenging to be marking you. But I'm just wondering, did you find it as challenging to be marking so many different kind of players, young, old, big, strong, kind of slim, whatever? Because there were so many differences in people's personalities, body types, strengths, weaknesses, whatever. Yeah, and it was. It was, it was challenging. But like I said about, you know, my memories of training, I used to love them. My, my favorite type of training would be you turn up and two teams are picked and you're just going out to play a match for an hour or an hour and a half. And I just absolutely loved it. Because like, it, su- it suited me because we trained in St. David's, which was marked out to be the size of Pro Park. So it was massive. And I kind of knew, I kind of knew early on because I don't know if you ever did, but some lads mentioned that they like, let's say there's Darren, Quilo, you, Decamani, you're all. 6'2", six, 6'3", six, and bigger than that. So you're used to playing midfield. You're used to marking fellas your size. You're not used to marking someone who's only 5'11". I'm not going to be competing for kickouts with you because I just can't. There's no point. So I'm just going to run. So I knew that some of you lads hated marking me. So that was to my advantage. So I just, I just worked with what I had, which was a bit of fitness. Uh, I didn't have height, so there's no point in jumping for kickouts. And uh, so I just run. But I actually remember, and it's it's a actual a tactical ploy that I still use to this day, where you would line up on one goalpost and Wheeler would line up on the other, and you would start in front of me, and then you'd slowly walk back, and you'd dart across, but you'd pull my shoulder, so I'd be turning like this, and you had gone, so you had four yards of me, and like. You did it more times than I than I care to say, but uh, <laughs> it was like it was you using your strengths against me, obviously. But having someone like Clucko, who when you just like, okay, all you needed to do really was find three or four yards of space, and he could put it into your glove, he could put it onto your hand. You know how was it, how important was it just to have someone like him to make you look good rather than? That, ke- that keeper that has the laces tied, the big buckle, and takes the big run and bolt on, like, you know. So, like, the cluck on have a big role in your success in midfield? Uh, well, the first question I have, actually, before I answer that question, are you trying to suggest that the only reason I beat you to the ball is because I pulled your jersey? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the fact that, like, Talty was refereeing or something, so. Yeah, yeah. No freeze ever. Uh, <laughs> I'd say... I'd say, to be honest now, when I think about it, like the way you the way you describe it there, you know, comparing goalkeepers, like we all know Klucko is probably the best has ever played. But um, like I probably wouldn't have lasted at midfield if I didn't have Klucko there because he just, he can pick you out anytime. And like I said, there's no point in me jumping for high balls, which like, you know, we played leash a number of times and they had these two six foot six lads midfield. What's the point in me jumping for kick out with them? It's someone like Clucker there who could just pick you out like a radar and put the ball on your chest or bounce it right in front of you, you know. And or or you could just dump it on top of Guido who would win the ball anyway. Uh, or Darren Home or Darren McGee or you or whoever's playing. And like he, he did, like everything that's been said about him in the last twenty years or you know, is right. He's changed the way goalkeepers play. And if it wasn't for him, you know, I think that midfield partnership probably wouldn't have existed. And like on that midfield partnership of you and Wheelow, it was like 
for someone who got to play against it as much as I did, it was really tough because I tell having having you and Wheelo together was obviously like Bowie's were very athletic and get, could get up and down the pitch, but you had that defensive game in you. And like when you look at your when you look at the match reports, it was Wheelo that was obviously the more offensive one that was doing a lot of the scoring, where you were doing all the holding and a lot of the link play. Was that ever talked about, or was that just something that just kind of happened because you were a natural defender and he was just a natural kind of attacker, or did you actually kind of say, right, you need to you need to hold the middle a bit more so I can make this run forward, or if I'm going forward, you need to cover back? Did you just have them conversations, or was it just like autopilot? I'd say more more autopilot. I mean, like Quilo had been doing that for years. Like one of his trademarks is going on a 50-yard run and sticking it over the bar at full pace when no one can catch him, you know? Like, he was playing, he was doing that for maybe eight or nine years before I even started playing midfield. So, you know, there's no, I'm not going to go in there and say, oh, hey, we love your new midfield partner. Can you just hold back a little bit so I can play and do a few runs there? Like, <laughs> you know, so, like, you're, you're right. I, I did have more of it at the back end as a defender there and... You know, I, I was never renowned as a scorer. Anyway, what's the point in me making these runs and trying to kick the ball over top speed? Like, you know, unless I'm ten yards out, <laughs> I'm fisting it. Uh, <laughs> but like you, you had like when you look back at 2005 and to, up to 2008, you had an unbelievable time in midfield, and and the partnership, as I said, was really strong, and it was hard to even break into. And I don't think teams fully knew how to mark you. And it resulted in you getting the All-Star in 2008. I know people like kind of play down the personal accolades, but how important was it for you and how much did it mean to you to actually win that All-Star? Um, I was very, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that's time. Yeah, I loved it. Like, obviously, I loved it. It was, it was great. And, I mean, I know, I know uh, my, my dad in particular would have been very happy with it and all that. And, be proud of it and, uh, and that. Um, obviously, it's no substitute for, for if you're able to win all Ireland. It's, I'd imagine, but it was. I suppose as time has gone on, I kind of think you think and you see, you see how all stars get picked every year, and you, you think, was I was I that good that year, or was that because was that a simply one? Was that because you know you played a few good games a couple of years before that and you didn't get one, and maybe they're feeling a bit guilty. You know, I, I wouldn't really say it's because you were amazing in 2008. You know, I think other factors might come into play. That's just where my brain goes a little bit, you know. Like, it was great. It was nice to have. It's lovely to look back on, you know. But, like, when you asked me there earlier, what was your what was my highlight from that era when Peter was manager, I actually honestly didn't even think of it. You know, I was thinking of winning Lencers or having the crack in training or having the crack for the couple of days after matches that we, you know, so, it, you know, it's, it's not something that would come to my head first and foremost if you ask me what's the best thing you ever did. Yeah, but it, it, it's interesting because your family is, like, steep in good GA stock and history. Like, your dad, your mom, your grandfather, like, all big stalwarts of, of the GA. Like, so to have an accolade like that, it, and, and, it, and me personally, I do think it was well deserved. Like you know, I thought you had an unbelievable year in two thousand and eight, and it should be meaningful. It should be something that you're kind of you're proud of because in that time there was a golden era of midfielders as well. Like you know, the midfielders that were coming through, the likes of Sean Cabinet. Like it was, it was tough to try and get it that back then as well. And for me, I I started to see you know people talk about Klucko and how he changed the game for goalkeepers but I thought you like the likes of yourself and the likes of Sean Cavanagh actually changed the role of the midfielder as well where now you look at the likes of James McCarthy coming in for Dublin and, and how important that is to have someone that's able to cover that ground and have the link with Brian Fenton so like do you, do you kind of see that working now in in the modern game where you see lads kind of complementing one another and players are picking positions to to bring, like if you have the Dublin half back line, having someone like Jack on the wing and Johnny Small on one wing and James in the centre, like you have people that can just get up and down and you have the physicality with Jack and James as well. Do you think it's important just to get them matches right 
for like from a Dublin point of view or from a if you're if you're Mark if you're setting out a game against Kerry you know you have to have the players beside you to complement one another the way you and Wheelow had that relationship I'd say these days a lot more would go into that kind of thinking than would have happened when I was playing there probably was a bit of that you know 10-15 years ago but I'd say it goes into a bit more forensic type detail nowadays where you are you know like from what I've seen with with uh, as when Jim Gavin as manager in particular he's, he goes into such detail and he has such a wealth of talent at his disposal you know you could have you could have two or three players who are just as good as each other in a position so you're going to pick well who, who's best suited to this particular game or who plays best beside James McCarthy or who plays best beside Jack McCarthy or whoever it is so I would like you know, I haven't, I haven't been around the, the team in when it, during the, that big success of the last, you know, nine years. So I can't really speak for uh, what they actually do, but that's what, it, that's what it looks like. Yeah, well, uh, like from from your from your days of playing in that role, did you always find you gravitated more towards a certain type of player? Like, did you when you were on in the defensive line? Do you kind of say, right, look, I need to be playing with the likes of Collie Moore and or Paul Griffin because their game, they'll they'll hold a lot more so I can do a lot more running. Did you find players that kind of brought out the best in you? I, I think, yeah, the, now that you mentioned it, I would have, um, we would have had, I think it kind of, it didn't really get spoken about, but you kind of naturally come to an understanding. But like I'm sure like all teams do, the longer you play with each other, you know, like um, if I was playing midfield and I'd come short for kickouts a lot and then you'd have like Paul Casey and David Henry on one wing. I know, I always knew if I win the ball here, uh, Casey's going to be running off my shoulder or if I'm even shorter, David Henry's going to be running. So you, you always have that natural understanding and they would know that I'm going to give it to them if they're running past me. And you're right, you would because I, you know, that would have been probably when I was playing, it would have been my favourite side favorite side to run to my left, but let's say Coco's right, because he's left-footed. That's where Casey and David Henry always were. And they're, you know, they're going to start an attack every time if they get the ball off me. Uh, different, yeah, different. It would have worked different ways around the pitch like that as well, like, you know. It's mad that you, like, you kind of, with Wheelow, you never really talk about it, it just automatically happened. With the, the likes of Casey and Heno again, it's probably never really discussed, but yeah, it happened and it just worked out for you. Because the current team and, and a lot of successful teams now, they'll overplay the situation. So it becomes so robotic. You're building that muscle memory where when it, when it happens on the pitch, you've talked about it so much, you've gone through it so much, repetition, repetition, that it just becomes autopilot. But you just kind of seem to naturally have that. Yeah, it's I, yeah, it, it did. Yeah, it's it just came from playing playing with each other for so long and playing to our strengths. You know, like Casey, as you said, was fit as a fiddle. He could run up and down all day long. Henna was a cornerback, but he was a fantastic attacking cornerback. You know, and like the odd time you get Paddy Christie, would be stuck on the edge of the square for you know sixty nine minutes, and then he'd just do a hundred yard sprint at some stage and he'd be gone and no one could catch him because he's so fast and you kind of you, you knew these would happen because it happened in training it was never kind of played out as here's the tactic right here's what we're going to happen for a point down we're going to kick it over here to Shane or kick it there to Wheel. that was never really spoken about um, but that was a lot a lot of about Pillar I think is he he trusted players to you know he trusted that players were going to make the right decision at the time that they chose they chose or they saw fit and he was, you know, I, like he was very much a, a player's manager and I thought he was a great man manager, you know, because I, I loved, uh, I loved, uh, you know, my, I have loads of fond memories and I've only, mostly, apart from horrible defeats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to touch on them. So that was other things. <laughs> yeah, because like, if you look back in, on, on your two big games for you in your last two years with the footballers, in Dublin versus Tyrone in 2008, like we scored 1 8, Tyrone scored 3 14. Dublin against Kerry in 09, we scored 1 7, they scored 124. So 
you know, that kind of leads me to believe that although we didn't probably talk about it enough as a team, they definitely did. Like they definitely knew what works for them and what, what how to really capitalize on our weaknesses and the own Mulligan goal like still haunts me every time I see him. Like, oh, we, we should have just hit him. We should have just stopped him. Uh, but like, for when you're looking at them games and, and when I'm telling you them scores, what do you think was the big obstacle for us not scoring enough? And what was the big obstacle for us conceding as much as we did? Um, that's an excellent question. If I knew that now, I don't know. To, like, when I think back, like when you said the scores me there, I got, geez, was it that big? Like, was that unbelievable? How much you can see it? Like, my, my memory of uh, 2008 was uh, that it was a wet, horrible day. I think there might have been like lashing rain and thunder and lightning and everything during the match. And one of our instructions was, you know, whatever you do, don't take the ball into the tackle or into contact because Tyrone, our masters, are ripping it out of you and dispossessing it. But, you know, too many of us did that day, I think. And Tyrone had their tactics right. And we just, it wasn't that our tactics were wrong. We just didn't, I think, follow them to the letter. Um, and then, of course, when you're, when, you're, when you go behind, if you're chasing the game and the weather is crap, it's very difficult to get back into it and we panic. That was 2008 anyway, you know, you just, you're nearly fighting against the tide here. This is, nothing seems to be working. Um, and Tyrone would just, Tyrone had so many quality players, they just increased their lead. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe we were overconfident in what we could do. I don't know. But things have been going really well for us that well, year. Well, if you look at 2008, like we had... Uh the semi-final in Leinster, a narrow win over Westmeath. We beat Wexford like, comprehensively in the Leinster final, and probably confidence was up. Then, like that scoreline, just kind of says it all. Like you know, about we, we were kind of exposed. We were, we had a game plan that didn't work out, and then as you said, when you go behind to a team like Tyrone, it's, it's hard to crawl it back, and then when the conditions were as bad as they were, it's even harder. And then in 2009, we go in and the same thing kind of happens with with Kerry. Uh, the difference in the year, like you're an all-star in 2008, you're on the pitch, you're able to make a difference. 2009, you come in when the game's more or less over. Like, you know, did you know that was going to be your last year with the Dublin footballers or were you just... Uh, no, I didn't know. I'd, to be honest, I'd always we'd always used to have kind of chats about it, mostly messing with. I talked to Mossy, David Henry, and Keeney, and that, and say, you know, we must go by hurling. We'd have to go by hurling. You know, we said well, we do it next year. Oh yeah, next year. Yeah, we'd always <laughs> joke about it. But you know, like when things were going so well, I always wanted to do it, uh, but I never actually seriously considered it. You know until, I suppose, after the 2009 season. Uh, I mean, I, 2009, you know, again, like, it was a new, it was a new setup. Pat Gilroy was in. There's a few new players on the scene, you know, like, Jerry Brennan was coming in, and, and, and Dear McConney was making a bigger impact, and uh, you were there, and, um, lot, like, you know, fresh faces and all that kind of stuff and a fresh kind of approach to it. And... Uh, like, I, I love training as well. I love going, as the year went on, when you got to the summer, I thought the crack was fantastic. The atmosphere was good at training. Uh, it was tough, but I enjoyed it. And, you know, we won, we won Leinster. It wasn't, it wasn't easily won. It was a hard one. I think we beat Kildare in the final. And confidence was high. I mean, I, I, I really remember having, really enjoying training from the Leinster final to the Kerry match. And I was, very confident. I wasn't. I didn't think we were. I didn't think I was overconfident. I didn't think I was cocky. Uh, I didn't think the team was. I thought we were well prepared for it. And I was. I was looking at it from the point of view of that because I. I didn't start any match that year, and I thought I'm only coming into my prime fitness now this season, and we're going to beat Kerry now, and I'm going to be in a great position to get get my spot back for the semi final and final. I was sure we were. We were. The team was going places until obviously Gooch scored after a bit two minutes or whatever it was. 
I mean, you look back at that team, like we spoke about you being uh, in cornerback against Kerry in 01. Like Paddy Andrews was cornerback against Kerry in 09, and now like he's a five time or six time, I don't even know how many all runs he's won a corner forward, like, you know. So when you look back on 2009 and the team, it was probably still just trying to find its shape like Bassey was full back as well like you know I think we were the team back then was just still evolving you know as you said there was a lot of new faces coming in people were just trying to find their rhythms and routines of playing with one another and trying to see where people and this gets back to my point earlier on about players being paired up against one another to make them look better so you know like other players complement players really well and that's kind of where I think the Dublin team are at now is they found the matches on a line that really worked for them and brings out the best of each other. We, you mentioned a few names there that I just wanted to talk to. The likes of Keeney, Heno, uh, you said Mossy as a hurler. I'll, I'll question that one. But uh, <laughs> like even Dermo and, and Kieran Kilkenny, do you, when did you think the dual star died? Like, because you were a dual star when you first came on. I think, what was it, 02 or 04? Of 2004, maybe when you stopped playing the Hoarders, was it? Or not? Uh, well, I, I didn't, honest. Actually, I I played 99 and I played a bit, I played like the league in 2000, and it played, I didn't play much after that until uh, until I got the call from Daly. But because um, I like it was what happened was I played in 99 and um, played both. And you know it required cooperation from both managers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Training was a lot different back then. It wasn't really like scientifically uh, laid out, and uh, there was you know weights wasn't really a thing. You know it wasn't at all actually, except maybe during winter. There was nothing during the summer, so it was just trying to balance your time between the two teams. Um, Two thousand. What happened was they changed the Leinster Championship. And they put Dublin into a round robin. So Dublin had four championship matches in the hurling, sorry. And uh, the manager wanted me, he said, here's the deal. You play for one week before each match, which ter- which worked out as in five weeks, I was four weeks with the hurlers and one week with the footballers. And, uh, you know, I, I just after the National League and I said, that's just not feasible. Um, you know, that's, I can't do that. Because like, then I might as well just say goodbye to the football, get my place there. So, it just, I just wasn't work, wasn't able to work it out. So, um, but but like but that was the end of it for me, pretty much. And and it kind of like I think Keeney is the last one who can really think of that was able to do a bow at a high level for Dublin. Uh, but it kind of tailored off around the two thousand and three two thousand and five era, where I didn't really see that many dual stars. And it's probably the case now for club. Like I think the demands that are on the players now and time commitments in regards, we've touched on a lot of it, analysis, weights, reporting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's even hard to do it from a club point of view. Now, never mind the yeah. county point of view. But like for someone like you to get that call from Dalo, was that all you needed for that decision to be made? Like you, you, you said you were probably him and on about it for a few years, but did that call just go? Right, that's the that's what, exactly what I need. That's the confidence to let me do this. Uh, it was it was it was what turned turned it for me anyway. I'd say, but I mean, like he rang me. He, I don't even know. He rang me maybe more in hope than anything else, and he was only ringing me based on a reputation I had from ten years earlier, probably. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as the reality was a lot different as he found out. But uh, you know, it was the Dublin had had a really positive year with the Herders the year before, and. Dela was coming in and it was all, there was a buzz, there was an atmosphere, there was a lot of potential in the team. And then when he rang me, I still, I agonized over it for a long time. You know, I, like I rang loads of people. Like I was, had long chats with my dad about what should I do. Like I rang, I, I remember ringing Ski Wade about it and ringing different, like what's your advice, what do you think? And uh, I wrote out lists of pros and cons for both sides. <laughs> I've never agonized over a decision more in my life. You know, I eventually just, it eventually came down to, if I don't try this, I'm going to regret it forever. Just to try, just to, like, I knew what I might be giving up. I knew I might be giving up the chance to win in All-Ireland. But 
on the other side, I thought, look, I'm gaining the chance to do something that hurling was my first love when I was a kid, yeah. you know, because I was used as a football when I was a kid. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I said, I have to, I just have to try it. I have to try it. If it doesn't work out, at least I can say I tried, you know. And like it worked out to that's medium success, I suppose. But, but like it had, it, to to try it is one thing, but to actually and I look at I'm watching that Michael Jordan documentary at the moment, The Last Dance, and when he came back from baseball, and yes, I'm comparing you to Michael Jordan from uh, rightly so. Yeah, <laughs> so, you're going back to. Is home. that because of uh, this? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because of that. Yeah, and yeah, uh, just to go how you spoke to players as well, the same way MJ did. But <laughs> yeah. if when, when he was coming back again, not comparing again for me, really, but coming back into sport, he said he spent so long building his body for uh, basketball. Then he had to change it to baseball. And then when he came back to, to play basketball, he thought he was in a position to be able to play, but his body wasn't, and it kind of fatigued him in the in the playoffs. When you went playing hurling, did you just find it totally different? Like you were probably a bit top head, heavy after doing so much weights with Dublin. Did you have to trim that down? How did you get your hand eye coordination back to hurling? Is it just four hours a day at, at a hurling wall, or what did you have to do? Like. Yeah, I'd say everything you said there is right. I was top heavy, bottom heavy, middle heavy, everything heavy. <laughs> Wintered well. <laughs> I mean, but it wasn't just that. Even like even at my even at my let's say fighting weight with the football, you know, as it turned out, I was probably five or six kilograms heavier playing football than I was as as the couple of seasons went on with the herders. And like I went like you know, I was heavy the weight I was or the size I was and the shape I was for football suited it perfectly. Hurling was just very different. And yes, you're right, it was very different. And it just took a couple of seasons of, you know, of basically changing the way I train, changing the way that I eat. Which, but then that also coincided with kind of, you know, new information coming out and new ways to, to balance your diet and all that. Because like, for most of my career, I was, I was always told, you know, carbs, carbs, carbs. Loads of carbs is what you need to eat. Until, you know, one day we get Daniel Davey came into the herders setup and he was phenomenal. And he said, no carbs. And he said he'd have, he'd had like three groups of players in the squad and he had, uh, okay, here's group one over here. You lads are too skinny. You need to eat an extra three meals a day. Then you have the middle group. He said, you lads keep doing, this is your particular diet. Have a balance of carbs and stuff. Then you have a fat club over here with Shane and a few other lads. <laughs> Who has said no, no ice carbs. creams on game day? <laughs> <laughs> but I never would have like I never would have eaten any junk food. Really, I wouldn't like, uh, you know I wouldn't have eaten. I wouldn't have been had like ice cream or crisps or like that. I just have you know shovelfuls of pasta and rice constantly. And he just that you know all that kind of coincided in the same time as as uh, you know playing the hurl and you know there was different different requirements. As you said, you have to go to the hurling wall every day for keep the eye in, and you know I'm sure some people would say the eye never really got in, but it, it was just it was ten years since I played inter county hurling when I started, and it was a very different game. Like same as football, football changed so much over the last years. Years hurling changed a huge amount as well. well yeah, like uh, and I and I think to to actually take that challenge on at the time of your career when you did it. Like speaks volumes about you as a player and you as a person that you you kind of you wanted to challenge yourself a bit more. You wanted to kind of see is this something that you can do, especially when the game is evolving so much. Like hurling was still becoming uh, a bit more physical, but uh, again the intensity in the games was picking up and it was becoming a bit more tactical as well. You know, when 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 you look back on your career, and one of the things you said is you you, you didn't want to play with any regrets. And like, I'm sure you have regrets now looking back on your career. But with the players you played with from both codes, uh, over four different managers, various different panels, who's the one player that stood out which for you? Like who who did you always just go, he's he's my favourite player that I've ever played with? Tough question, but everyone's answered it. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question, yeah. Um, 
in both codes, you know, is that what you're saying? Any code? Any, any code. Well, I don't know. I mean, you'd have to, this is no, goodness. I'd have to, uh, I'd have to uh, well, divide this up into a few categories now. What will I I'll tell you who, like Collie uh, Moran picked uh, Alan Brogan. Well, Alan, I'm not picking him, so. Yeah, he picked Alan Brogan. So Alan I'm, not picking, Brogan. I'm not picking Collie, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Brogan flicked, pre, uh, picked <laughs> dinner. Uh, Paul Casey picked, uh, ooh, I can't remember who Casey picked. But yeah, they, like, they all picked someone as well and getting that, so. Yeah. Well, it'd be hard to pick just one. Like, like I mentioned, I did love, I did love playing uh, alongside Paul Casey because we had a good understanding. I think in that, you know, he was always he always seemed to be there to give a pass to. I was he would always give me a pass if I'm close to him, and you know I always loved getting the ball. So if someone gives me the ball, I'm gonna love playing with him. Um, <laughs> But you know, the, the, yeah, like that was, the, you know, that was. I, I mean, I did. I played alongside Paddy Christie for a good few years as well, and uh, you know, a man of few words, but uh, it, it was, you know, just a, a reliable man beside it. There was enjoyable. You mentioned I, I forgot actually about. I forgot about how could I forget about Flinner because he was kind of a another breath of fresh air when he came in, like just running with abandon and having all that energy and ability there, you know. But it's very hard. Jesus, horrible question. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd, I'd say I'd, I'd stick with I'd stick with Casey. See, when, we, when this call finishes now, I'm going to think of about five others that I didn't mention. <laughs> Hopefully, like, I'm obviously, on that obviously, list, yeah. obviously, it goes without saying that like my favourite years playing with Dublin were midfield playing beside Wheeler. So it goes without saying that I love playing with Wheeler. Yeah. But we were play, we were very different types of players, you know. So we didn't really interact on the pitch, as in. It wasn't that we either win the ball, give it to me, or do or do it around. So I loved playing in a midfield partnership with Wheeler, but we were two very different players, you know, and different styles. So I would have more like interaction on the pitch with the likes of Casey or David Henry in the backs, because I'd be back there a bit more. About Barry Cahill or you know, um, lads like that. Yeah, give me the most roundabout answer in the world. I'm just going to say it was Paul. Get off the fence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll say his case. We'll chalk it down his case. Uh, on the current Dublin team now, who would you like to most? Who would you most likely? Who would you most like to play beside? So, who which player do you think would bring out the best in you now? The future on your on the current team. Um, I don't know. The, f- the few the few standout players that I, I love watching are, you know, like the two Bryans from Rohini. I just class Fenton and Howard. And um, <clears throat> they're just so reliable, and I like. I particularly love watching Brian Howard because he's a little bit shorter than the other lads, but he's got a massive jump on him. He's got a serious sidestep, which I really appreciate. Oh, it's just class. Like you know, he's going to do it, but you can't stop it. You know. Yeah. And I, I love watching it. You know, and Kieran Kilkenny brings players around him into the game. Look, it looks like he's doing simple things. He's just hand passing, but he's bringing lads into the game. He's changing the point of attack. Um, but that's like you talked about complementary players earlier on. That current Dublin team and of the last number of years has all those players complement each other. Kilkenny keeps other players in the game. James McCarthy sets up attack from deep. Brian Fenton can do it all. Brian Howard can play backs, forwards, midfield. They all complement each other. Like any of those lads, I would love to play alongside. So your phone is on, is what you're saying, if Desi's looking for <laughs> the midfield of the cover the ground. Uh, well, look, Shane, that's the last question I have. Uh, you'll be pleased to know. But I really enjoyed catching up with you. Obviously, me and you had a lot of crack both on and off the pitch together. And mostly off. Yeah, mostly <laughs> off. <laughs> so if you are good times, and it's probably... Sad in some ways that it's like this that we had to connect, but in other ways it's great to reminisce and looking back on your time in Dublin from 1998, as you said, up until 2009 with the footballers, and then your time with the hurling, and then afterwards, like 
over a decade in the blue jersey and what you've done for Dublin, as I said, I, I do think you were a bit of a catalyst for changing the midfield role and um, you know, how players kind of adapted to that role over the years. So, look, I enjoy this. Great to catch up, as I said. Uh, hope the family are doing well. Congrats on Congrats. the baby, three months old here. Thanks, Eamon. We haven't really talked about that, but again... I'm sure we don't need to talk. I spend all day with them every day. We don't need to talk about that. Okay, fair enough. Good luck. I loved catching up with you as well, Eamon. Uh, it was great. Great to talk to you now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just I'll give you the final word, but it was, you know, you, you were one of the main factors in having all the crack I had. It was great. Like To be able to have a laugh when you're suffering on the pitch is always important, I think, you know? No, absolutely. And I, you kind of mentioned something about like the All-Star... Uh, didn't mean as much to you when you were looking back on your memories and like I, I look back on that trip that me you and Klucka went on uh, uh, like it's one of my standout moments of my time because it is the journey you know like it is their moment yeah. and then trips away to tourists to clones to Longford to Amsterdam that we went on as well so like Stock, yeah. Stockholm as well yeah, Stockholm as well and I think that holiday still hasn't been beaten <laughs> I think there's a few other stops on that trip as well. But before we get into the, the finer details of that, I just want to say, look, thanks for this again. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed listening to it and watching it. Cheers. Thanks, Eamon.